Okay, so there's one comment from Pingali uh, Venkat from uh, on YouTube. He's saying one challenge I see is data goes through non-SQL channels. Environment tends to be com complex, so we need more mechanisms. Do you want to talk about that uh, non-structured data bit? Yes, uh, this is definitely a challenge, right? And uh, like I think Venkat is probably a more experienced person than I am in this stuff, but. Uh, like I think machine learning pipelines are uh, they are pretty new, relatively. Where they give any compared to data warehouses and databases, and uh, there is uh, it's it's a different beast, and we definitely have to uh, figure out how we can uh, answer these same questions in the machine learning pipelines or the life cycle that data goes through through machine learning pipe cycles as well, right? So this is, uh, again, this is a pretty new field. Uh, definitely need better solutions there and we definitely should discuss it, right? Uh, I personally don't have any experience with this stuff, right? Uh, but yeah, like I'm not an expert in machine I, learning pipelines. I, I, I guess we'll get Venkat to share uh, yeah. his sector. Yeah. use his things time. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We should just get him over here and just have him yeah. talk about it. Uh, anyone else wants to bring anything? Uh, Devakna, do you want to come and step in and talk about some of the tools that you mentioned uh, while we were discussing to how to host these meetups? Um, sure, Srinivas. Um, so uh, just before I go there, I think um, um, I'll just sort of address the question that was posed just now on the um, on tracking the unstructured data. So my role largely uh, uh, is in that space, uh, being a data scientist. And one of the things that we have actually started looking at is uh, even when we are working with um, with unstructured data, uh, it is not that the uh, that there is no kind of cadence around what data are, are we using for say a model building, right? So at any given point in time, you are creating certain snapshot of data. Now, uh, when we talk about, and Rajat was mentioning this earlier, right? Data lineage becomes quite important in order to trace what kind of a life cycle is your data going through and what changes have been made, who has been using it, et cetera. So uh, using a similar pattern to the unstructured databases, or data sets, um, uh, what one could actually do is look at what, sc uh, what snapshots in time are you creating for a part of this data set. So for instance, if you're training a model, you are uh, not perhaps using the entire data set, but rather a sample of it, right? And that uh, sample becomes a snapshot of your data at any given point of time. Um, so in terms of maintaining data lineage, would you would you version that sample somewhere for future reference? Uh, model versioning, code versioning, data versioning is still uh, is still something that uh, a lot of machine learning engineers um, are actually dealing with these days, and it's sort of not a very mature field. But in some of the projects that I'm involved in, we are definitely looking at how do we bring in uh, data we need with respect to not just individual data, but data sets that are being used for uh, model training and, and for other purposes. I don't know if that answers uh, the question that was posed on YouTube. So I think other way to say it is that the questions are similar, but I think the way we find these answers is going to be different, right? Between unstructured and structured data. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The the foundations of it remains the same, right? right. Um, so if it if we are talking about um, uh, it in the context of data lineage, the foundation of data lineage still remains the same. The uh, the goals of data lineage still remains the same. It's rather the implementation of how would you implement, say, data lineage for unstructured non-SQL databases. Right. I think Venkat says it's good enough answer. Okay. Anyone else here? wants to raise anything, bring up your own stories of what you're doing within your uh, setup.
I think it's just open for anyone to just come up. It's a, it's a meetup style thing, and we're just trying to learn from each other. This is the first session, so I'm going to be asking you to just come up with any questions that you have or just any stories. Just feel free to chip in. So I think the other uh, something else that I've been involved in, but I didn't get in get into when I was um, doing the talk is data obfuscation, right? Uh, so you have PII data, you don't want to give access to everyone, but you do want to give access to some some of the columns or some of the attributes of those data sets, but not to the sensitive columns, right? And how do you do that? There are a couple of ways uh, you can hide the data. If you have a pretty uh, sophisticated system, what you can do is you can hide the columns that have sensitive data to people who are not supposed to see it or you can uh, throw out gibberish, right? You can hash it and throw it out so that they don't see what the actual data is and so on and so forth, right? If you're, like, if you're not sophisticated, then you pretty much have to make a copy of the sensitive data, remove out all the sensitive data and make a complete copy of the table, right? And make a complete copy of all the tables that you want, right? It is uh, surprising how many people take the latter approach, right? Uh, uh, they use a big hammer to say, hey, you know, I'm going to make a copy of all my tables and just remove the data set, right? And this had so much operational overhead, so much uh, uh, also increases costs, right? Because you have suddenly have another copy of petabytes of data that you want. Right? Uh, that's another big, big space, which, like, you know, which we need to have, uh, like, which we need to figure out good solutions for. Rajat, I think Venkat raised an interesting point on YouTube saying that how do we figure out the economics of doing this, considering it might require a lot of skilling and who's going to pay for it and how can organizations say adopt this inside? Like you worked on some of these organizations, right? Where there data governance policies that were set up, how was this implemented on ground? Yeah, yeah, there's a... Uh, uh... Like I can give my experience, right? But it would also be nice to hear from uh, the other people out there who worked on these projects, right? Uh, so I think uh, uh, this whole area is considered a uh, cost center, right? Uh, so this is uh, this is not something that creates value for you, but saves money for you, right? And the way it saves money is by not breaking laws or not by like or not by having a data breach, right? Uh, there are studies out there that like, you know, put a number of about, like, you know, $3 million for data breach, right? So let's say a bank has a data breach. The cost of that is about a few million dollars, right? And the, uh, like, there's a whole process about how they figure it out and so on and so forth, right? And the other big cost that you save is by not going foul of the laws and regulations that are there in your region, right? Be it EU or in the US and maybe in the near future, even in India as well, right? So that are you trying to not spend money, right? So it's considered a cost center. So you need to have uh, the fear of laws or the fear, like all the repercussions of data breach to put these uh, systems in place, right? That's at a high level. Uh, like you would love to hear what others have to say about this stuff as well, right? If their experience is similar or not. Like I think this kind of came up in a close discussion that we had uh, a couple of days ago. So I would just add to that. I think that's a that's a great point, Rajat. And um, I think even in my experience, um, I've always seen this to be uh, looked at as a cost center rather than anything else. And hence the um, it, it always sort of becomes an afterthought or rather a second priority. Um, and however, I think I would say uh, the blame is perhaps on us, on the data community to some extent, because the examples of how uh, this is important uh, and shouldn't be looked at as just a cost center um, 
those examples are not available right now. Those concrete examples are missing from the whole discourse. Um, so for instance, uh, some of this, uh, so uh, the conversation around, uh, or rather the implications of having poor data governance feeds into something like, you know, your data quality. And data quality has a direct implication on the products that are built on that data and the services that uh, organization is providing on top of that data. And that's a real implication in terms of you know, say dollar values, that is, uh, you know, perhaps always the first consideration. Um, and that narrative around how does data governance feed into poor data governance feed into poor data quality and poor downstream, system, uh, downstream systems is actually uh, not complete. Um, there are not enough examples. And hence, I feel like every time the conversation happens, it all becomes a matter of you know, adhering to um, to responsible data practices, um, it, it sort of becomes an individual effort um, rather than something that a go the organization should look at as a first class citizen. Right. Uh, but the, uh, this is just like tech debt, right? Where yes. you like until it hits, uh, you, you like until your engineering team hits a wall, you don't realize how bad your tech debt is, right? Because it kind of creeps upon you, and I think data quality is similar, right? Until you start seeing bad results from your machine learning algorithms or from your reports, that's when you kind of wake up and say, hey, you know, where did, you know, how did we go so wrong? And then it's a rush to kind of get things fixed. I have Mohan on YouTube asking me when we talk about compliance requirements of GDPR and right to delete my data, uh, it's very difficult to implement, especially in large enterprises, when you really don't know where data is being stored. Any pointers and recommendations or, or tools that one can use, even in commercial domain? Does someone else want to take this question? Yeah, like I can talk from my experience as well, uh, but uh, like I'm assuming others have more experience. If, if you've worked on GDPR, if any of you worked on GDPR yeah. complex inside your firms, I think uh, please step in. Yeah. I mean, I can talk about it just as uh, like I personally haven't worked on uh, right to forget, uh, though I have been part of discussions just because you know, like I have deep experience on internals of databases and how do you go about dealing data, dealing data from a Hadoop data lake, right? Uh, like, so I think the first step is to be frank, to get to know where your data is, right? And we kind of address that uh, topic. Uh, let's assume that you know, someone's data is stored in different data systems. I think the hard part over here is that some databases allow you to delete and some databases don't even have the capability to delete, right? So if you have data sitting in MySQL, it's not very hard to, like if you know which tables the data is stored in, it's not, like it's not that hard to kind of go and run a delete command and figure it out, right? Uh, like, and get it done, right? Uh, and uh, the, like the problem occurs when you're storing data in your data lake, either in HDFS or something like cloud storage, which don't really give you good uh, operations to go about deleting a single row, right? And um, it, it, it's pretty hard. Uh, you have to, uh, like the few techniques that I've seen or I have discussed where, like, you know, what, uh, uh, what it comes down to is that you shouldn't uh, process these people's roles in, like in subsequent marketing campaigns or uh, add the data into your subsequent reports and analytics and machine learning and so on and so forth, right? So people just obfuscate the data. Like, you know, uh, you put a delete marker there saying that, hey, you know, this data should not be used for processing anymore. That's one way to do it. Right? And you can eventually, when you get an opportunity, kind of rewrite that whole data set to actually delete the roles once a month and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so there's, uh, like I think, just stepping back a bit, uh, like you know, there are easy, easy solutions for some databases, hard solutions for other database, and sometimes you have to use the hammer of a rewrite, right, to be able to delete it. Uh, but I think some companies are struggling, even in the prior step, right, where you don't even know where the data is, right, and you have to go and 
use text like scanning and data lineage to be able to figure that out. Yeah, just adding to that as well, uh, the other question would be, uh, should we have such tools? Because uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a regulation, right? And, and uh, they will be, there, there are certain criteria to adhere to these regulations and compliance. Um, and everyone's data is different. If, um, every organization's data, the way they're storing it, the way they're using it, the way they are managing it is quite different. So yeah. um, I haven't come across like sort of a, a single, um, you know, a single short solution for GDPR, even in the projects that I've been part of, or some of my colleagues have been part of, but definitely what helps is, um, is to break down uh, what kind of compliance are you looking at? And that would largely also depend on whether you are looking at a greenfield project or is it a legacy system? Uh, employing um, GDPR compliance in legacy systems is much, much harder, at least in our experience, and it is a multi-year journey. Um, a lot of organizations which are working on uh, legacy systems um, and making them compliant to GDPR are mostly looking at proving intent rather than a solution because it is that hard. Uh, it is much difficult. It is much easier to sort of, um, um, you know, set up the right checklist, uh, the right cadence when uh, we are initiating greenfield projects. So what typically I've seen helping is um, when we look at everything that GDPR covers, breaking that down into what are going to be the primary concerns for us, what are going to be the secondary concerns, and what are going to be ter tertiary concerns, and then looking at what tools and technologies and methodologies exist around tackling each of those concerns. Um, so open source system, open source uh, world is quite rich in terms of looking at these specific concerns under GDPR and similar regulations and, you know, helping with that. So for instance, if data lineage is one of the concerns, then uh, the open source ecosystem is quite rich in order to sort of provide you with tools and technologies to cater to data lineage, uh, data cataloging, etc. Um, so uh, it does require to take that first effort in creating the blueprint and then breaking it down into uh, what you need solving and what is available for that right now. Also, it becomes easier to uh, identify data sets when we have a single source of data source, but uh, bigger companies, as you mentioned, since uh, the data leaves uh, one source and goes, uh, percolates down to many different microservices and they have their own ecosystem wherein they, uh, uh, they use their data uh, and out of, out of that, if it goes outside my boundary of the organization to something like a fintech uh, world where we have to work with a lot of fintech partners outside that org and to maintain the lineage of that data becomes extremely difficult. And for that, I believe one of the major things that uh, a lot of uh, companies apply is the user consent which a user has to you know give consent to the organization that he he is educated in a way that he his data will be going outside that boundary as well that becomes paramount otherwise uh, even the user may not know if the leak or the data which is getting the outside that boundary is somewhere else and uh, you know my credentials or my pi data is leaked he will not be uh, knowing about it so giving that consent and that education to the user also becomes very important. So a lot of this is kind of compliance requirement that actually happens when there are actually codified requirements. And because the say India's data protection law is just at a, a draft stage, uh, do you think even some of these uh, practices can be codified? Uh, like, for example, uh, we may or may not have right to be forgotten. Uh, that's to be decided to, by the parliament. But classification of data, for example, is, is something uh, which can be done right away, right? Because you know what is sensitive data and what's not sensitive data because sensitive data is mostly personal data or business data for, for the industry. Uh, do you think there are any guides that one could adopt uh, while doing this, at least in terms of classifying data? So far, at least in my experience, I've seen uh, 
few folks who have started late in the journey, uh, it becomes very difficult to do discovery, data discovery. And uh, I've been part of one such journey in, in my company where it was uh, a year long program management exercise to figure out the data uh, sources and uh, not sources, the placement of data where exactly uh, the data is lying and, and what kind of uh, sensitive data is around the places. The security principles and the boundary will differ in every source, but then to get the entire discovery in that uh, or was extremely difficult. So it became like an exercise to, you know, year long exercise for us to do that. And post that to arrive at a uh, world where, you know, we get compliant to a right to forget kind of a thing where a user with a click of a button, we have to link data from all these places. It becomes extremely important to restructure a lot of these architectural uh, decisions that we have made in the past and to uh, you know, come at a place where one system can understand all the inventory of these data sources and can send the signals to all these data sources. So it, it becomes a huge exercise and uh, the sooner the better is what I believe. Um, just to add on top of that, I think, um, you know, uh, as you asked, uh, uh, the data classification can be codified or not. I think it, it depends on the business kind of business you're running. And uh, the only thing what we have is basically the guidelines. Um, you know, like some of the thing is very common, like this PII. Uh, I think all around the world, the definition is slightly different because, you know, uh, because of the government regulation. But most of the part are common. The thing is basically the uh, business, uh, the identifying sensitive business data is the challenge. And that is where I think, you know, uh, somebody has to, I mean, um, at a central tool, we cannot, you know, codify that uh, because, um, you know, even for the identifying PII, most of the tools fails to identify Indian or South Asian um, country data because they, they fail to identify phone number structures, right? Stuff like this. I think that is going to be a challenge in my opinion. So also there's that, and then there's the other aspect, which is around whether, so what, what do we classify as sensitive, whether this is uh, sensitive um, on the face of it, or could it be actually de-anonymized by joining up different data sets? Um, and this was, uh, I think uh, Rajat was sharing a great example earlier around um, the, the cab services uh, in the Bay Area. Um, so one of the things that I have seen working out, and this has been a very rare situation where it has happened, um, is when, uh, when you, uh, when, when we start looking at just, it, just beyond technical teams to, uh, to, uh, classify data, to help classify data as sensitive, private, um, and perfectly fair to share. Um, I have seen that sometimes what goes missing is is the whole user research activity around it uh, for instance we could look at uh, a direct pii data like phone numbers addresses um, names um, etc and classify that however uh, different cultures have different contexts in terms of sensitivity so for instance if we were to look at uh, north america uh, perhaps uh, the not just the exact address, but just the locality itself could go uh, could give away uh, which economic background you belong to, which racial background you belong to. Um, it will not be uh, the same cultural context that will be applicable in India, but you know you might have other considerations um, over here. So, for instance, even if you have your surnames and your surnames will not give your uh, actual identity, but they might just sort of become a very strong proxy for something like religion, which is sensitive. So there is a user research angle to it. There's a cultural research angle to it that often goes missing and it becomes a purely technical exercise, which actually ends up making it hard as well. Um, so in one instance, in one instance, I have actually seen that bringing in that aspect actually really helps to make this exercise much more better and much more efficient. I think we should do one of those exercises sometime in one of the meetups. Yeah, that's a great idea. 
Yeah, I think uh, this is really a new uh, area. I think what uh, Devanga mentioned. I think uh, not many companies follow that. I think that would something will be you know uh, easing the uh, classification exercise for the specific business. So at, at at some level, a lot of these designs need to be included when you are initiating the project cycle itself, and and then. Uh, most of the people who have been advocating this was primarily the security folks, right? Uh, whenever you had a security team, they always used to consider this part of the life cycle, security as life cycle. I think now you're, you're, you need to additionally have compliance team who are also going to be looking at all of this since the design cycle of the product starts, of any new product that starts. Uh, but but I, I don't see them emerging until the compliance requirement is made mandatory by a regulator. Uh, let's just hope that companies realize this and properly work on it. It's better to do it from the start than uh, retrofitting it after your product is up because it increases your costs. Yes, and, and actually there's another problem to that. Um, uh, in my experience, like wherever I've seen data governance committees and stewards being appointed, they are given responsibilities, but what often is missing is what kind of accountability do they have? So if something were to go wrong, who would be accountable? Because um, I think uh, dealing with the, the money loss uh, question is probably the easiest one, right? Um, uh, we have seen enough examples wherein there are major data breaches that have happened. Um, but those organizations are still sustaining and thriving. Um, maybe it was a couple of millions of dollars losses, but then uh, it didn't you know, shut down the entire organization. However, who gets uh, affected is the user, right? And if something uh, were to be leaked out, they are the ones who get impacted, but then there's no accountability uh, per se on, on who was responsible for it. So I think one of the... Uh, one of the need of the hour is to also look at uh, data governance, not just as um, convenience, but actually to appoint it in, in almost like a legal structure. So if something were to go wrong, the people who are uh, responsible for uh, ensuring data governance within the organization have very clear responsibilities defined and very clear accountability defined around their role. We are almost at the end of the time. If anyone has any closing comments, Rajat or anyone else, let's just do it and we can end it with this session. I think yeah, the hope is that we have more of this. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's my closing comment, right? Uh, uh, so, so there was one last question from Venkat on what timelines are we looking for PDP? Um, I think it's somewhere going to come end of the year, maybe if it gets, if the parliament sits, but with COVID, there is no clarity on that front, but we're looking at least something which is going to come out or get operationalized in 2021, at least later part of the 2021. So companies probably got an year or two to look at these. Okay. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we are going to actually continue these conversations through a Telegram group. Uh, we'll send you an invite through your emails, uh, which you have registered. Uh, you can join the group and we can do this post the meetup as well. And we will have some focused discussions over every meetup. I, I don't know if Rajat, we're going to do it once every month or say bi-weekly, uh, but it will be depending upon the activity and how much people want to participate. I think Rajat can yeah. help you with that. Yeah, there's also a poll, right? Uh, we'd love to know yeah. what other people want to hear as well, right? So uh, we have a poll on how the event was happening. So let me just launch that. Uh, so yes, so the poll is up. Just let us know what do you think of this and so that we can improve these sessions and ensure that they are focused and suited for your requirements. Yeah, or send us feedback on Twitter or LinkedIn, right? For those people who are not on, uh, who don't have access to this poll, I'm guessing. People on YouTube and so on. Yeah, and so, forth. so just let us know. Uh, uh, 
even in the telegram group uh, we'll send you the links on how, what you feel and what what is missing probably in the space or what needs to be with covered 